Okay, so our presenter today is Janice Moody. And Janice has been a jack of many trades. She's worked as a registered dietitian, dental office manager, small business consultant, bookkeeper, and co-owner of a construction company, and office manager and kitchen bath designer for her son's construction company. But her true passion was gardening. In 2010, she became a UC Master Gardener and discovered her true calling in life was starting her business, which is in Half Moon Bay. Um, called Seascape Succulents, and she's also a garden designer. And Juan is putting in a link to her business in the chat. So I'm turning it over to Janice. Thank you so much for presenting today. Thank you, Paula, and um, welcome everybody out there in Cyberland. I hope you come away from this presentation with a lot more knowledge as to how plants grow and how you can design your own garden in the process. And then um, I hope it inspires you to get out there and get your, get your hands dirty once this is all done and over with. So let's get going. Um, who are the Master Gardeners? We are volunteers trained and certified by the Univer University of California to provide community service and educational outreach that helps home gardeners and community organizations gain sustainably and create a healthy environment. All right, and you see this, this is who are the master gardeners? Yes. Yes, all right, we're good to go. Um, you can, so we are volunteers that educate the public for free. And we are educated by the University of California to help home gardeners and community organizations garden sustainably and create a healthy environment. We have a helpline you can call any time of the day and leave a message. Our hours are limited during the week, but someone should be able to get back to you within 48 hours and answer your question. You can also email us at the email address shown here. And you could also become a master gardener should you choose to. Um, We're taking applications in, a, in about another year or so. We're skipping one year. So we won't have a class in this, this year, but the next, following year we'll have another class. So you're all welcome to apply and become a master gardener like I did. So our learning goals today are to introduce you to succulents, what they are, definition-wise. Um, I'm going to go over pre-planting considerations, and then we'll have a Q&A after that. Um, and then landscape design and another Q&A, and go over care and maintenance tips and questions and answers again. And then if there's time, I'll show you my YouTube video on succulent propagation. Now we won't be covering container gardening and I realize some of you had questions regarding container gardening and pots and house plants, but I'm sorry we don't have time for that. I did prepare another presentation on that subject that I could do at another point in time because they're kind of a whole different animal in terms of keeping them alive. <laughs> so um, I'd rather not go into them very much in depth today at all. Um, I won't be going over art projects as well, and I touch on cactus, but I don't go into it very deeply because we live in an area that doesn't um, lend itself to cactus growing as much as other succulents. So first off, what is a succulent? Well, it's a drought resistant plant that stores water in its leaves, stems, or roots. For instance, a cactus up here. This is, all this water is stored in its stems, not its leaves, which are those little prickly things, but its stems. And then the, the aloe, the spiral aloe that you see here, it, all the water is stored in its leaves. And then some examples of plants that store water in their leaves and stems would be, for instance, aeoniums down here. And then there's also leaves, stems, and roots, which would be agaves. I don't have one shown here, but agaves store water in all parts of their, their anatomy. And then there's also things that, there's succulents that, steer, that store water in their roots, such as the elephant foot palm right over here. I lost my cursor again. I have to get my cursor back again, sorry. All right. Now, the succulents in the landscape, there's pros and there's cons to succulents in the landscape. I'll go over the pros first and then the cons. So they're very drought tolerant. That is true. It's not a fallacy. Um, they offer year round color and interest because their foliage is, is very colorful many times and not just their flowers. And they also have very interesting geometric shapes. Many of them do such as that spiral aloe that I showed you earlier. 
They're relatively gopher and deer resistant, although not 100%, and I'll mention some uh, exceptions to that. They're usually very easy to transplant because they have very shallow root systems, most of them, except for, let's say, agaves and aloes, they, they go a little deeper. Um, they're easy to propagate, very easy, and I have a YouTube video, and, sh and I will show you that if we have time at the end, or you can watch it later. And they're easier to maintain than other drought-tolerant plants, in my opinion. There's a lot less pruning that needs to go on, um, just, just a lot, you know, a lot less deadheading that has to happen. So in, in my opinion, I don't, I don't have to maintain a, a, a succulent garden nearly as much as I would other, an, another perennial garden. The cons are they're more, they're most, most are sensitive to freezing temperatures or hail. So you, you risk losing them whenever it dips below freezing, although some are very, you know, hardened to that, so, such as the stiff leaf agaves that can handle some freezing temperatures, but most of them don't, don't do well below freezing because of all the water content in them, basically. Uh, their cells burst when they freeze. Um, many are sensitive to extreme heat, and I know that there is this fallacy out there that all succulents are desert plants. That's not true. There's, there's very few that are, live in the desert. Most of them live in temperate climates like ours. Um, they're fragile, they break easily, so you cannot let your dog roam free in your garden if you have a lot of succulents, unless you have a well-trained dog. Um, they're, they're dangerous if they're spiky, and some are so pointy that they could pop a basketball if you threw it on top of them. And others are a lot more uh, flexible, but some are very spiky, so you have to be careful of those agaves. They can rot if they're too moist for too long a period of time. And um, that's, I think, if anyone fails with succulents, it's usually because they overwater and they tend to rot the plants. So um, when I talked about deer, just, and I said there were some exceptions to that, that for the most part, they don't like to eat succulents unless they're very thirsty. And in this case, this was in Prisma Canyon, at the end of summer where there was not a lot of water around and they actually shredded this agave, which started out looking like this up above and ended up looking like an artichoke leaf by the time they were done gnawing on it. Now the spike on this uh, agave blue flame is not very sharp so that I could see them trying to eat this, this uh, um, plant. But this one over here, this, very, this uh, agave americana variegata, very spiky all the way along the leaf edges, if you see that. And they were so desperate for water and food, perhaps, they started gnawing at this at the bottom. So you can see that, that damage down there. So they're not 100% foolproof, but I would venture to say that most deer would not touch an agave americana in normal circumstances. All right, so... Um, Pre-planting considerations. Before you go out and buy a truckload of plants, um, these are the things you should consider as to, you know, do you have a place for them? Um, can you mimic their natural environment as, as best as possible? We're gonna talk about sun requirements for many of them, uh, climate and temperature ranges for some of them, uh, the type of soil they prefer, the drainage and how key that is to success, and also the garden size. Now, mimicking natural environment, if you research where they came from, that gives you a really a good clue as to how to grow them in your garden. For instance, these spiral aloes that grow on the, in the mountains of South Africa, on a steep slope normally, grassy area, so this, the ground is pretty fertile, but they can get covered in the winter with snow and survive. So that's unusual for an aloe, but this one has has genetically modified itself so that it can handle snow, whereas it does not do well with heat. So anything, if it's, if it's over 80 degrees for a prolonged period of time, this plant will not thrive. So that's a key to keep in mind if you're going to invest in a spiral aloe because they are the most expensive um, succulent that you can purchase. And I, I grow them from seed in my apartment just because you know, sourcing them is so hard. So I know how much trouble it you go to to get them to that size. Now the Dudleya 
um, these little dudleyas grow in crevices along the rocky uh, coastal bluffs. And so if you live on the coast, then dudleyas would be a good choice for you. Now these agaves here in the desert of Sedona, um, they don't need much care at all. They can handle extreme heat and very poor soil from the look of the soil and still survive, although they, they're not thriving, but they're surviving. Now, in, a lot of people come into my nursery here and they ask me, can all of these plants be grown outside? And here, here of course, obviously they're all being grown outside. And I mentioned, I point out to them, but the sun is the source of their energy. And without sun, plants would not grow. So they need either, either direct sun or some indirect sun. If you put them in a closet and shut the door, they're gonna die on you, even if you water them. So you have to always give them some sun. If you put them in your office away from a window, you're risking that plant not, not surviving. Um, even there are some that can tolerate less light. And you know I do sell some of those that are marked that low light tolerant, but um, for the most part, they do need some, some light to, to grow because they take the light rays and the carbon dioxide from the air and the water from the ground, and they make carbohydrates for the plants. And that's what forms their leaves and their flowers. And that's how plants grow. And you also wanna consider, um, where you have your sunniest areas and your shadiest areas. And uh, for the most part, the north side of your house is going to be the shadier side of your house because of the winter solstice being so low in the sky. See, the arc of the sun is very low in the winter. So this north side of your house gets shaded more so in the winter than in the summer where it arcs actually over the top of, of your house. And this probably would be very, very sunny in the summer months and around June 21st, summer solstice, unless you had a very large overhang or let's say a two-story house. So just keep those things in mind when you're determining where to put a plant. Okay, so sun, we, for the most part, most succulents need a minimum of four to six hours of sun per day for photosynthesis and growth to take place. This is the majority of them, not all of them. Some need more than six hours, like agaves. Some can get by with less than four hours, um, like haworthias and gasterias. Um, but for the most part, this is their sweet spot, four to six hours. And if you live in a hot climate, I would suggest, you know, indirect or morning sun is best for, for planting most succulents, unless they're agaves that can handle like desert temperatures. Uh, the, keep in mind that variegated or yellow leaves prefer less sun because they have a tendency to get sunburned. The more yellow the plant is, the more sunburn prone they are. And uh, more sun usually improves the colors as with this Echeveri elegans, the pink edges get pinkier with more sun. And I just wanted to point out, this, is, this other plant on the right side here is the same plant, but it was buried underneath a very big plant, had no sun and it kept reaching and reaching for the sun until the tips came out. And see how the, now it looks normal at the end of the plant? That's because it finally reached the sun and started growing in its normal fashion instead of, instead of having these long uh, stem regions between their leaves back here. So, and this is what can happen in your office if you take this plant, put it in your office. It's going to start reaching for the sun and elongating if it, if it requires this much sun. <laughs> and here's some examples of sunburn. So this is a, a kiwi aeonium uh, in Sacramento, and it, in Half Moon Bay and the coast, no problem. These usually, usually for the most part, we don't experience too much sunburn here. And the same for this aeonium, that this uh, sunburst aeonium is very yellow in coloration. And many times uh, the, sunbur the sunburst aeoniums I have have a lot more green in their leaves. And those are the leaves that really survive to maturity. These ones that are truly 100% yellow or almost yellow, they very seldom reach maturity. So just keep that in mind when selecting plants, that a little green in these, in these variegated plants is a good thing, not a bad thing. So here's some shade tolerant favorites of mine for the landscape. Now I mentioned some other ones like Haworthias and Gasterias and some aloes. Um, they're also shade tolerant, but a lot of them I don't include in landscapes because they're too small. You, you know, if you planted a Haworthia or Gasteria, you 
probably wouldn't see it from a distance because they don't get to be very big. So I'm focusing today on plants from the landscape that actually show up from a distance. And these right here are some of my favorites that can tolerate a little less light than maybe four hours. Uh, the Aeoniums, they seem to do well on the north side of my building here. This is a kiwi down here, and this is a Portolacara afra variegata, variegated uh, elephant food plant, or the common name is elephant food. Um, it, it doesn't do well here in the wintertime unless it's sheltered from, from the, the cold. It, uh, it pr prefers heat. So um, I only see this growing on the south side of buildings around here, and, and uh, for the most part, I don't usually use it in coastal landscapes, but it can, over in the other side of the hill, I think you could grow that very successfully. The agave attenuata ray of light, it has some variegation in its leaves and it, and it uh, does better in uh, morning sun or part shade. Here are some sun and heat loving succulents. And I said I would touch on some cactus uh, here. And I am only mentioning golden barrel because um, you know, I see them occasionally around here and I do sell some of these, but not a lot of them. Um, these, this one can handle a lot of sun and heat and also euphorbias. This euphorbia sticks on fire uh, does well with, with sun and heat. And in the winter time, I have to protect these plants and bring them indoors at night because they just, they don't look good here on the coast in the winter time. Apuntias seem to tolerate the winter okay here so far. I have very few of these, but they seem to be okay over the winter in pots in my nursery, but I don't usually plant them in the landscape. Um, and then here's some, an assorted variety of um, agaves and all of these can handle the sun. This is this variegated one a little bit less than the other ones, but these other um, agaves over here can handle the sun very easily. And here's a green leaf, Portolacara afro, or elephant food, that can handle the sun better than the variegated one. Okay, so let's talk about climate and temperature. As I stated earlier, most succulents prefer moderate temperatures between 60 and 80. That's their sweet spot. Um, will they grow with, if it's 50 degrees out? Yes, they will grow, but not as well as if it's between 60 and 80 for the most part. So in the winter months, um, you'll, you'll experience some slower growth, especially if it's like 40s and 50s. Um, and in December and January, you can't expect much growth to happen at all because of the short days. So just keep that in mind. In December and January, they're kind of like, eh, yeah, dead months, <laughs> my opinion. Um, so, and I, as I said before, the very few grow in the desert or freezing conditions, but this is what happens to an agave attenuata after frost damage, it just goes limp. It looks terrible. I was out here covering, I had two agave attenuatas in my demonstration gardens, one in the front and one in the back. And I went out and covered them with row cover during this last frost we had in March, which was highly unusual to have frost in March. We had three nights of it. So I would go out and cover these up and I just kept the row cover on for three nights until the, the frost was no longer predicted. And the only the tips of the leaves got damaged a little bit just because the row cover was leaning on the tips. Um, so that's one way you can, you can help with freezing temperatures. Uh, this is hail damage, believe it or not, in a, in a Calendrinia spectabilis or rock purslane. So that's what happens after a hailstorm. But they, it soon recovers. In a few months, you probably wouldn't even notice it because of new growth appearing and the leaves getting larger. And here's the row cover I was talking about. When you want to cover your agaves up or your tender aeoniums, sometimes they, uh, I did have, I did lose some aeoniums during this frost. And um, that's because we had three nights of it in a row and I had some young tender plants in pots. So all my aeoniums in the ground didn't suffer at all from the 32 degree nights that we had, uh, but some new ones, young tender ones in pots did. And these are the aeoniums, the floret looking plants right here. Um, and then this is that calendrinia I mentioned before. Now here's some um, cold hardy succulents that um, usually the char characteristics of the cold hardy succulents are they have deeper root systems such as aloes and sempervivums and agaves. And so even if, the, if they suffer on top, their roots 
help them survive and then they come back again once temperatures warm again. And so I've been told by people that live in Montana that these sempervivums do fine. They're Colorado too. Sempervivums seem to be very hardy in the landscape. I don't really plant a lot of sempervivums to tell you the truth because they are small and they blend with the soil so much that you hardly see them. So I usually prefer plants that you know show up in the landscape against the soil. Um, this spiral aloe, of course, shows up very well. It's my, uh, it's my trophy plant. And you can view this in the, my backyard in my demonstration garden if you choose to come by. It's, it's everyone just oohs and ahs at that plant. And this seed and repressed ray lemon ball is another one that uh, seems to survive pretty well over the winter. It doesn't, doesn't uh, suffer too much. The other ones are the less juicy leaves, such as some of stiff-leafed agaves, um, opuntias, sempervimas, again, Yucca leaves are very kind of stiff and not very succulent in nature. Um, Delospermas and then some creeping sedums that die back in the winter. There are some stone crop sedums that tend to die back in the winter and then come back again when the temperature warms up. And the uh, um, cold temperatures also improve color some many times with echeverias, for instance. So uh, even though echeverias prefer warm weather and they're summer growers, they um, do pink up after um, a winter going through winter. I've already shown you these. I just thought I'd show them again because I was talking about heat now instead of sun. So just reiterating, these are both heat and sun loving succulents. Other uh, heat tolerant favorites are this, is this Oscularia deltoides or pink ice plant. That one gets very large. Um, and cascade and can cascade over a very large tall pot as well. It's one of the few succulents that get that big and cascade. So I use that a lot in both the landscape and in pots. And this crassula arborescence um, is, is heat tolerant, but it sure didn't like the three nights of frost we had and it's still recovering from, from that. It looks a little bit damaged, has some damaged leaves now. This um, alustriata, did, did fine with the frost that we had, and, but it does, it can handle a lot of heat. And in some climates, like for instance, in Davis, when I was there at the Botanical Garden, they, they tended to put these aloes underneath another plant to give them some shade from the afternoon sun because they, they can handle a lot of heat, but not necessarily direct sun that well. They're not really a desert plant. Here are some other heat and cold tolerant agaves. And um, the ones I use routinely would be agave blue flame. It looks much nicer than this in, a, in its uh, full grown mature state. I can probably show you pictures of that in my future slides. This agave blue glow is gorgeous too. And they stay moderately sized. They're not huge. Like in agave Americana, I have a 10 foot agave Americana in my demonstration garden in my backyard. And it's just gone crazy. And I, most people don't have room for a 10 foot agave in their backyards. But so I try to stock ones that, that you know, are, are uh, moderate in size. And these, the agave blue glow and the agave blue flame are like two to four feet at the most. And so it's, you can handle it in a usual landscape situation. And this agave Victoria Regine, um, it's a Queen Victoria. It's a beautiful plant, very slow growing. So normally the stiffer the leaf, the slower the grower. Uh, this agave blue glow has a very stiff leaf with, with um, spines on the tips that could pop a basketball. It's that spiny and it's very slow growing, just the same as this agave Victoria Regine, the Queen Victoria uh, agave. It's also very uh, rigid leaf, but very extremely slow growing. So that's why they're priced higher than other agaves. And the same with this agave um, quadricolor. It's also very spiky and thin leafed. And then the um, agave per perii retro choke, that one as well. So um, just, just so you keep this in mind when you're planting things, um, there is a period of time when some succulents are growing more than others. And for the most part, the in the landscape, the, the ones I choose in the landscape, the vast majority of them grow in the cooler months. So all of these on the left side, Aeoniums, Aloes, Calendrinia, Dudleyas, all of these are cool weather growers. 
and and then all the summer growers that I usually carry are the agaves, the echeverias. This is an echeveria here, this agave, um, euphorbias, the oscularia deltoides, that pink ice plant I showed you, petalanthus, which I don't carry, but um, and sepervivum. So it, relatively speaking, there's only a, a few that grow in the in the warmer months. Most grow in the cooler months. So just Keep that in mind when you're planting things. If you're gonna plant a cactus, don't do it in the winter. I guarantee you it will rot more than likely if we have normal winter rains. It will not be growing. It'll just be sitting there and not sucking up the water. So it's better to plant things in, their, in the, the times when they're growing the most. Now, um, on to soil. Um, this is another pre-planting consideration. Some people ask me, Oh, I got I got such hard soil. I, I have to put. I'm, I know I'm going to have to add so much to it to make it grow succulents, aren't I? And I go not necessarily because when I got here in my location on Main Street in Half Moon Bay, I thought I had the the crustiest soil around. Well, I it came to find out that yeah, it I call it black crust, and it, it can be crusty at times, but. You put mulch on that soil and believe it or not, it opens up the, the pores of that soil and forms aggregates and all of a sudden that soil becomes very porous. So that's kind of the key to success and I'll be discussing that more as I go on. Um, just a little bit about the carbon cycle because we want to reduce climate change and improve the soil health and they, they work together. We need to reduce carbon emissions and greenhouse gases and retain more carbon in the earth. So the blacker the soil is, the higher in carbon and rich in nutrients the soil is typically. Black soil is better than tan soil or, or yellow soil or red soil. Um, and soil prefers to be covered with plants or dead organic matter such as mulch, compost, or leaves. So don't blow your leaves away if you can help it. Blow them under your tree, keep, you know, from your walkways, but keep them under the tree because that's what nature intended. That's, that's the way to sequester that carbon into the soil and keep it there and open up the pores of the soil and make your soil much richer and healthier. Um, so it's nature never intended soil to be bare. Bare soil is dead dirt, in my opinion. Um, avoid tilling as much as possible, even though, you know, that's our typical agricultural method is to till the soil, but, you know, studies have shown that if you can grow things without with doing minimal tilling, you'll have healthier soil and more sequestration of carbon. And there's a, a great documentary out there called Kiss the Ground, and one of our farmers here, our local farmers, is um, highlighted in it. Uh, the Mark Guard family. So I recommend watching Kiss the Ground on Netflix. If you ever get a chance, you'll learn a lot more about this. And we master gardeners can't do a presentation without talking about the soil food web. And this is, this is the key to healthy soil, the covering the soil with either roots or dead organic matter. And, and it feeds the microbes in the soil. Those little fungi and bacteria, they feed off of all that dead organic material or living organic material. And, and then they feed the plants what they need when they call for it. So there's a mutual symbiotic relationship going on between the plants and their roots and the microbes and they feed off of each other. And that's what leads to a healthy plant and a sustainable garden. So you wanna you know, feed your soil, not your plants. So we're talking about feeding those little microbes and the microbes will feed your plants. And then they'll bring in all the nematodes and, the, and all the other protozoas and the worms and the millipedes, and they'll open up your soil and form aggregates, make it much more porous and much more nutrient rich. Keep in mind, there's more microbes in one teaspoon of healthy soil than there are people on earth. And most of these microbes are not pathogenic. They're beneficial microbes. They're healthy. If you didn't have gut microbes in your gut, you would die. And if we killed all the microbes on the soil, in the soil, plant life would cease to exist and we would die. So microbes are critical to our health. Don't shun them. I know we're all used to wearing gloves and masks these days, but there are a lot of good beneficial microbes in the soil that you need to get in touch with. So don't be afraid to get out there and get dirty, okay? <laughs> Here's um, 
but ideal soil. If you have this, you're you're really lucky. Um, so if you if you have 45% mineral in your soil, which is consists of clay, silt, and sand, and 20% happens to be clay, which retains water and nutrients, and 40% is silt, and let's see, 40% is sand, which sheds water and nutrients, then you are good to go. You've got great soil. The only other component that you need is organic matter, and that's humus, that partially decomposed organic matter. Um, and that helps improve soil structure and feeds the soil life and helps also retain water and nutrients just like clay does. So, you know, they can work together in the sense that this organic matter can, can help if you've got really extremely clay soil. Um, it can help open up the pores of the soil, as I said before. And if you have really sandy soil, it also can help to retain water and nutrients such as that clay does. So, just, just keep that in mind that um, it's always good. Organic matter added to the soil is always beneficial. And then half of your soil is usually composed of airspace or water and they, in, they exchange, you know, during the course of the day or the week or whatever, and, you know, usually you water every, and that 50% pore space is filled up with water. And then as the week goes along, then you get more air incorporated in there because you, you want air, the microbes need air. Microbes need air, water, and um, and food, and they and they're good to go. This is my my soil in my um, in my parking lot that <laughs> I had when I moved here six years ago or so. This is what I found under the parking lot. It's a extremely hard, dense, dense soil. And it's had gravel on top of it for many years. And over here, in another part of my parking lot, we had a mulched area. And look at the aggregates and the and the pore is pore space in that. And I guarantee you, this weighs probably half as much as this soil right here, just because the microbes were in there, the insects moved in, and it created all this space in that very dense soil. So don't give up on your soil. There are some exceptions to um, soils that I'll mention next. If you have something like this, for instance, if your soil is moldable and you could actually mold it into objects or like ashtrays like we used to do as kids, um, then that soil needs amending and, and it will be too heavy and hold too much water and uh, for succulents to grow well. So what in this case, and you don't need to like, frantically write this down because I'll send you the PDF of the slides and then you can review this later on. But for heavy clay soil such as this, it's very dense. Um, you wanna add one third fine redwood or wood shavings to it, one third quality compost or aged horse manure. That's what I tend to use here uh, as a top dressing is aged horse manure. Or, and then one third pumice or coarse sand or very small lava rock. I would prefer probably pumice and coarse sand over the lava rock. That's just my preference from doing some research. But if you, if you till in three to four inches of this into the first six inches of your soil and then leave it for a time being water it and then let them let the microbes start living again and moving insects in, then you'll, you should be able to plant in that in you know three, three months or so give it. I would probably give it like three months over the winter maybe. Another important factor to success in the garden is proper drainage, because if, if your water settles in a certain spot in your garden, those succulents will drown very quickly. You want to choose a higher versus a lower elevation. So raised beds are great, such as this bed here on Howard Street. This is a raised area in the front of this home, and it works perfectly for succulents. They are very happy there. You can also create mounds like, like this one here. And this, would, this is in Ocean Colony, which has an, that notorious clay soil that I showed you before. So this is one way to get around that awful soil by adding, bringing in some soil and raising it up, and then you'll have much more success. Um, avoid downspouts and sump pumps. Over here, I planted a garden on the edge of the property line and noticed that the rain, the downspout, diverted all the water right along this strip. So we had to add this uh, pipe or yeah, flexible pipe here, uh, plastic, 
and we added, we just stuck that onto the downspout and diverted the water onto the driveway and that solved that drainage issue there. Uh, garden size is also important because if you have a huge area that you wanna cover in succulents, it's, it's gonna be difficult without pathways because you're gonna be walking amongst these delicate plants, you're gonna be crushing them. I guarantee they're gonna, there's gonna be some damage. So it's better to have access from both sides of the bed if you can. Um, in this case, this is the front of my building here and I have access, I have like six inches of space back behind here that I can squeeze in and do some uh, weeding and, and cleaning up from the rear. And I also happen to have this little fence around here and this is a good way to keep dogs off of your garden while it's growing is putting a little wire, 18 inch wire fence around it. And it's, it's hidden here with all these plants. But this kept the dogs from jumping in and doing damage along the street while my, while my garden was growing. And this uh, raised bed over here can be accessed from both sides easily and reached into. Uh, you can also add pathways as with this garden on Poplar Street. They, I did not design this, I just helped with the redesign of it. Um, but there's pathways in here so you can access all of these little vignettes and do your maintenance. And um, over here, this woman needed um, to get to her plants easily and she was disabled and had to carry an oxygen tank with her. So she had this stairway in, um, added, which really helped her get to all of her succulents on both sides. And then over here, we have a little uh, footprint stepping stones that go around this little area with a, some centerpiece here of a pot in the middle. That was a cute way of doing that. So I'm gonna break for questions if, if you have any at this point. Um, we, so we have a few, couple. Um, for weed abatement, are there any succulents you'd recommend for low ground cover, preferably medium to fast growth? Um, there, the weeds are going to outcompete with any succulent ground cover that I can think of. Um, there's a fairy crassula, and I don't have that in this presentation, so I'll mention that. That's a crassula, and it's a red, red fairy crassula. That spreads pretty quickly and not in a lot of sun. It prefers part sun or in the coast here with our fog, which we don't have anymore for some reason. We don't have fog this year. But normally the fairy crassula can survive in our sun here on the coast, just fine in full sun. That's, um, that one grows pretty quickly. But I think any suck, I think weeds are gonna beat, beat out the succulent ground covers in most cases, unless you do an ice plant and there's, there's one ice plant that has adventitious roots and it roots as it grows along. That might work. I haven't tried it myself, but that does root as it travels along. So that might help. And there's some other ground covers that I'm gonna discuss in the presentation, but I, I do think that the weeds are gonna win the, win the war on those. <laughs> Um, is the demo garden you refer to a master gardener demo garden or one at your business? Um, yeah, it's my demo garden here at my nursery, um, Seascapes Garden Center in Half Moon Bay, and it's behind my building. So that's where I direct people if they've never been to my nursery before, I, I automatically direct them to the demonstration garden because I have plants in their mature state so people can see how they grow. Okay. And then I'd like to know what is the maximum di diameter for a jade plant cutting that I can propagate? Well, we're gonna, we can talk about that later in propagation, but um, geez, I mean, jade, you can throw it in your neighbor's neck, you know, you can throw it down on the ground and it will propagate itself. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's, it's the easiest thing in the world to grow, <laughs> yeah. Um, I have some succulents that are overgrown. What is the best way to cut the flowers off and maintain these? Yeah, we're gonna discuss that in, in, in another section of maintenance. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then Michael's asking, can you spell out the plant names, please? That might've been when you were talking about the weeds and, but- Oh, um, 
Crassula is C R A S S U L A, and it's called Red Fairy Crassula. Um, the other ones are going to be labeled, I believe, as I keep going on. I think I have labels on a lot of my plants. And uh, yeah, I think they are labeled. So, and and when I get, oh, yeah. go ahead. No, go ahead. The last question. Um, is my stone crop sedum seems to dry out so quickly and I guess they live in Belmont. Is this normal? Well, a lot of stone crops will die over the winter. That could be her, her problem there. Um, if they're drying out, then maybe she's not watering deep enough, which we'll be going over when I talk about watering. Okay. And I think you're going to talk about pests later. Someone's yes. asking uh -huh. if you're going to discuss pets. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. All right. Okay, let's get going then. Uh, so now let's talk a little bit about landscape design and how you can best plant those plants so they can be viewed from your vantage point. This is a, this is a garden, a beautiful garden. As I said, I did not design it. I just helped with um, the, maintaining the health of the plants when she asked me why things were suffering. So. I gave her some hints on that, but this is on Poplar Street in Half Moon Bay. It's just a gorgeous garden. So here is a, a beautiful garden that um, gets a lot of compliments. And this is on at 717 Howard Avenue, Burlingame. I did design this one and helped install it. And it just does wonderfully. I think Burlingame has the best weather for some, one of the, some, I mean, seems like the best weather not too hot, not too cold. I don't think they had as much of a frost issue as we did here. Every, when I went back to, make, to look at this the other day and I didn't, I didn't see any evidence of frost damage. So they have pretty ideal weather. And it's a raised bed situation and the soil is very good as well. So it's a, it's a plus plus. We're gonna talk about, um, in the next few slides, we're gonna talk about color and contrast, adding shapes and textures um, to lend interest in your landscape and adding heights and layers as well. First off, I'd like to talk a little bit about the color wheel because these, there's a way you can design your plants. You don't necessarily have to stick to these, these suggestions. You can just do random colors and mother nature works any way you want it to. You know, you can add lots of different colors together if you, if you so choose. I tend to do um, vignettes of warm colors together. So on the left side here, this, these are considered the warm colors. And I will a lot of times combine these colors together in maybe one vignette of the garden. And then the cool colors are the more ocean blue colors on this side and, and some greens. And note that there's yellow on both sides. And I do use yellow in both, both color combinations a lot of times. Here's um, an example of similar hue and cool colors, for instance. These are, here's a pastel, similar hue. Um, and then here is a, a combination of cool colors over here on this side. Here's a, an example of warm colors, the, the, uh, the earth colors, you might, you might call them, the pinks and the yellows and greens. I think that, that combination always appeals to me. Um, here's an example of complementary colors. And I tend to do this quite often because I like, I like to get my gardens noticed. So if you combine, if you look, notice the, on the color wheel, if you look at the opposite end of the color wheel, yellow and purple, and here's an example of yellow and purple. See how that pops and how it's so striking in the landscape? And then let's say orange and blue for, is another one. And here's orange and blue over here. And um, then red and green. And here's a combination of red and green. So, you know, the Christmas colors, red and green, that, that's, that's obviously done on purpose to catch your eye. Here's an example of a lot of complementary colors in my friend Cynthia Nation's garden, her backyard. So when this is in full bloom, it's just eye popping, isn't it? It's gorgeous. 
Um, here's where I use a lot of contrasting in brightness in, col in coloration. So I, I tend to use a lot of these black adder formiums here uh, in combination with yellows, such as an aeonium kiwi. And then here down here is a crassula capitella campfire. And uh, you, this is a, a way of designing uh, pots or landscape by using thrillers, fillers, and spillers. I will mention that in another slide, but if you're talking about thrillers, fillers, and spillers, you would call this the thriller, the, the focal point, the tall plant. The filler would be the kiwi aeoniums, and then a spiller would be this uh, crassula campfire. And here's uh, examples of other contrasting aeoniums put together in the garden. I, I always like to use the dark against the, the lighter yellow color. This is an aeonium swart cop back here, and these are aeonium sunburst and then aeonium Mardi Gras. I also try to lend um, to vary the shapes and textures because if you only use, like, if you only put aeoniums in your garden, it's going to be kind of boring. Even if you do some contrasting colors, you know, aeoniums are those big florets, so you want to lend as much uh, diversity in terms of shapes and textures so your eye doesn't get tired of looking at the same, same dimension. Um, this is a Ruth Brancock, a Brank, Bancroft garden. I haven't been there yet. I should make a point of going there, but they use this. Um, they vary the shapes and textures quite a bit in their landscapes. And here's an example of changing the shapes and textures here. This is an Echeveria afterglow. Oscularia deltoides, and then this is uh, Echeveria elegans or snowball, Mexican snowball. And here's this, this agave americana right here. Well, this was about five years ago. Now it's 10 feet wide. This is the monster in my backyard. We call her Audrey from the Little Shop of Horrors. She is something to be seen. But yeah, that's how fast that monster can grow. So just be aware of that if you plant an agave americana. Here's some colorful companion plants for height that I use that are non-succulents. And this will, this will also help you navigate through a, a, a deep garden because you're not gonna damage these as much as you are succulents if you walk among them. And they take up a large amount of space which is helpful too, because if you just did a succulent garden, you're, you're probably gonna spend a lot of money because succulents tend to be on the smaller size, except for a few exceptions where that will, they get, they grow larger and expand. And I, I'm, I have a slide on those larger growing ones that, that tend to fill in spaces. But for the most part, you're gonna spend a lot of money on a lot of in, individual plants if you go with all succulents, and then you're gonna have trouble getting in between them unless you have pathways or rocks. And I forgot to mention rocks, but I use a lot of boulders and rocks in my landscapes and they not only let add dimension and, and um, variation, but they also serve as stepping stones. You can lean on a rock and do a lot of weeding and, and maintenance that way. This is a Leucodendron Safari Sunset. Here's a Veshenaria Yacoides Flamingo Glow. And this is a Cordyline Electric Pink in a pot. Um, here's a leucodendron safari gold stripe. So I tend to use a lot of leucodendrons and formiums and not so many cordylines because they don't always do well in the landscape. They seem to do better in pots than the landscape. But in my experience, the cordylines are a little bit fussier to grow. So next we're going to talk about varying heights as I alluded to before, the thrillers, fillers, and spillers which is, is a design concept. I did not coin that phrase. That is common, commonly used in landscape design, not my terminology. This is the Howard Avenue um, garden that I showed you earlier from a different perspective. They love that little tortoise that, that they had to put that and in, include that in the garden. I think it's darling. Um, so there's a little pathway in here so that we can get in here and do some maintenance without, without doing too much damage. And you should stop by and see this. It's always evolving, growing. Here's some examples of thrillers. Um, any tall, tall item in the landscape that draws your eye. It can be art, for the instance, this cactus. That can be uh, your thriller or this aloe tree here, or this agave, Medio Picta Alba. 
This one is only but gets about four to five feet, I'm told. It doesn't get 10 feet like agave americana. So it's a nice one for the landscape. Um, this is an agave attenuata that's uh, small right there, but it can get four feet in width. And then this is a pot in a little um, central island kind of in the backyard where there's a pathway around it. So this is the focal point. And it's in the middle of this little island because you can view it from all angles. You always want to consider your vantage point as to where to put your thrillers, fillers, and your fillers, because sometimes it may be in the center, maybe not be in the background, but ideally you want the taller ones in the background and then you go shorter to the foreground so that you can see everything. Here's some uh, medium height succulents or companion plants that surround thrillers and lend a little variety of color or texture. Um, this, these aeoniums are nice fillers. For the most part, they, they don't get really tall, although there is one tall variety. There are a few tall varieties that get four feet tall, but for the most part, they get two to three feet in height. And then these Echeveria afterglows, this Dudleya bertonii, which gets much larger than that normally. It hasn't full, been fully uh, matured in this picture. And this, um, and the rock as well. Here's some, a, a filler, you know, rocks don't need water and they really help um, warm up those plants. You know, the Echeverias that I had growing next to this boulder survived winter better than the other Echeverias I had planted elsewhere that weren't up against a boulder. So they can retain heat and actually help those succulents through a winter time. So just keep that in mind when you're planting uh, those, those heat loving succulents, maybe putting them next to a boulder is a, is a good idea. And then here's a, bit, a very large Aeonium canariense that this floret gets about a foot across. It's pretty big. Here's some spillers or otherwise, other, otherwise known as ground covers. Um, they fill in the gaps and areas towards the front or edges. And you want to choose plants that contrast with the soil and, co and soil color to add visibility. So if you were to put Semper vivums as your as your um, ground cover. Um, they're very cute and everything, but a lot of them don't stand out in the landscape because a lot of them blend with the soil. So they're not necessarily a great choice in my opinion. Uh, they're, they're better in pots, in my opinion. Um, this Echeveri elegans I use a lot of here. This Sedum rupestre angelina is, um, hmm, it's not real. It's not in that picture, actually. It's over here. Um, I don't see the Angelina in this photo, but I see the seed and repressed ray lemon ball over here. And this is one of my favorite ones. Um, and it survives winter just fine. This Crassula red pagoda is beautiful right now as it elongates. It has nice little flowers. And it doesn't, you know, over the winter, it doesn't look that great, but it, it, it bounces back and becomes more compact in the spring and summer months. And this sedum um, jelly bean here, this is a, a favorite also, but it, it's very fragile though. You know, a dog runs through that and it's gonna knock off a lot of leaves for sure. This, um, what I'm showing here is, is a, this is a, oh, da, 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 it's not sedum repressed ray. Oh, it's, it's a confusum. It is a sedum confusum. This is another favorite of mine, which I may be showing in another one too. That holds up pretty well throughout the winter and looks good most of the year. Okay, so the, also I tend to add some, what I call poppers in the landscape, just things that are bright or contrasting in color that draw your eye, such as red, pinks, and yellows, because anything other than green is going to draw your eye, correct? Because everything around it is usually very green. So these, this red pagoda has the red accent. This campfire has the orangey color. Uh, this Echeveria afterglow, which is on my logo for that, is my favorite plant. And when it blooms, it's just, it's gorgeous. And then the hummingbirds are all over it. The hummingbirds just love this, these blooms from the Echeverias. And here's an Aeonium sunburst. That's one of my other favorites I use quite a bit. Now, um, if you have a large space you want to fill and you want to use succulents, you can do it. Um, as I said before, you might want to add, use some formiums or some 
leucodendrons or leucospermums to fill in some, some of the space so that you don't spend an arm and a leg on succulents and then you, um, you can walk among things a little bit easier as well. But this, um, this aloe arborescence, torch aloe, it starts out small and then each year it mounds upon itself and it becomes a beautiful plant and then it attracts hummingbirds like crazy to these flowers when it blooms. So um, that's a big, that takes up a lot of space. Um, this Calendrinia spectabilis, it, or rock purslane down here, it's all over the coast and it blooms almost all year long here, except for maybe the dead of winter. Um, and it, it, the only drawback to this plant is it looks a little stemmy and leggy after about a year or two years. So I cut it, I cut it back to a tiny ball of stem. So this is one plant in this, or actually this is two plants, but it can get four to five feet wide. So when you plant this one little plant, keep in mind, give it at least four to five feet of space. And then when you cut it back, you cut it back to like one foot by one foot. So it, it's just a bunch of stems, but it'll come back again fine in a matter of months and look great again. Um, the other ones that take up a lot of room are this uh, Aeonium cyclops is this big, big one back here. I should probably put this in a, in a garden setting so you can actually see how big it gets. This gets about four feet tall. Uh, Crossula ovata or jade, that one's so common. Everybody's, everybody's got that in their garden and it, gets, it can get very big and doesn't need very many nutrients. It just survives years and years with very little care. I tend not to use this Ovada very much. I tend to use the, there's a smaller leafed one that is a little bit more colorful that I, I use more often than this um, Ovada over here. And then uh, this is, uh, let's see, Portalacaria afrit can take up a lot of space if you live in a warmer area other than the coast. Um, this, um, Aeonum canariense, this one, as I said before, gets very wide. The leaves get very wide and it mounds upon itself year after year and takes up a lot of width. And then the um, cotyledon orbiculata down here and the bulbine fructensens, this keeps spreading and spreading. So if you want something that spreads, then choose this one here. And it's, it comes in a bright color as well. Let me get move on. Okay, so here's my demonstration garden that's behind my building, my nursery. Um, and uh, here's the spiral aloe. It's actually bigger now than in this, in this photo that I'm showing here. This is the agave um, blue flame. This is the agave blue glow. And this is the echeveria. That is my favorite plant and another echeveria. And this is the agave quadricolor and then this is the ground cover that I use most often, the confusum, sedum confusum here. And some of it is lemon ball, um, sedum lemon ball. And then this is the um, Echeveria elegans. And what I like about this Echeveria elegans or this, uh, the Mexican snowball is that it doesn't get crusty as it grows. There's a lot of them like the Im impercata, I think it's called. They tend to, to hen and chick like, like this one, the elegans, but they tend to get crusty and need a lot of leaf, you know, deadheading. So I tend not to use that as much. Um, let's see. Now this over here is the uh, other area that I showed you earlier. And now the um, agave attenuata. This suffered a little bit with frost, but it's about three feet wide now. And this is the canariense aeonium. And this is the crassula uh, swart cop the black rose and see the beautiful blooms. When it blooms, the contrasting blooms against that color is just gorgeous. And let's see, and then it's Echeveria afterglows and the Dudley of Bretonii again. And this is a, another agave attenuata caris stripes, which is a gorgeous one. It's very, very yellow in color. And so now I'm going to go over my favorites a little bit in more detail in case you didn't catch what I was saying. I think I have these all spelled out for you in the, in the next slides. Here's the Calendrinia spectabilis that I talked about. Um, as I said before, it blooms all year on the coast. I cut it back in late winter to just a little ball of stems. 
And um, the only real disadvantage is that sometimes they just die. And there's no real reason. I have not to I have not figured out why this one planted right next to it is healthy and fine. And then this one right here just died. So no, no, um, no reason, no rationale for that, but it can happen. But they, they grow so quickly and they're so inexpensive. You just plop another plant in and no time you've got a four foot of plant again. Um, the gophers tend to like this plant because the stems lay on the surface of the soil and gophers will eat things that are very close to the soil level and they'll poke their little heads up and eat around their hole. Sometimes they'll even come out in the middle of the day. I've seen some wander out in the middle of the day, um, very brazen. They must not be used to any predators. That's all I can tell. Um, but for the most part, they usually don't go far from their hole. And so they, they like to chew on this, but um, if that happens, I, I don't recommend gopher basketing. Because, you, know, you might wanna lay some aviary wire on top of the soil. You can, it's a flexible three quarter inch wire kind of like chicken wire, and that might help, but I don't recommend caging these. There's very few plants that I recommend caging against gophers. The only ones I might do routinely would be formiums, those New Zealand flaxes, because they're an expensive plant and gophers love formiums. They love to eat formiums. That's probably the only thing I would cage. Here's the, again, the, um, if, here's the spiral aloe in my garden. And they do prefer cooler climates or afternoon shade. Um, they can tolerate a lot of cold. So they're not for everybody. When people come in here and tell me they're from the valley, I don't recommend that they buy my spiral aloes. I'm, I'm very honest about that. <laughs> Here's some of my agave favorites again. Um, the, the blue uh, flame, the blue glow, the quadricolor, and then this, um, this Queen Victoria which I have yet to see on the coast grown to full maturity just because it, mine grows about, you know, an inch a year. So it, I, I don't know if I'll, I'll live to see a full grown one in my, in my backyard or not. Here's some of my Echeveria favorites again. Um, the Afterglow over here, the Conte, which is a, a, a parent, one of the parents of this Afterglow. So they took a pinker Echeveria and, and bred it with, uh, cross-pollinated with this um, Conte and they got, and they, this was the result. And this is a little bit hardier in the landscape. This one's a little tougher to grow, to be honest with you. And not everybody can grow that one, the Conte. And then this is the Mexican snowball are the Ele Echeveria elegans. Um, it tends to probably rot more easily than most just because their leaves are so compacted together. I think that's the reason if anything's going to rot in your garden, it's probably going to be this one. But if you see that, you can always just get out there and take a, a trowel to it and lift it out of, the, out of the ground for a while, let the roots get some air so that it doesn't suffocate. And then this is a Lady Aquarius, a curly-edged uh, agave, I mean Echeveria. Here's some of my Aeonium favorites. This is the Sunburst again, and here's the, their name for you down here. Um, the Swart Cop, the Mardi Gras, the Kiwi, and the Kiwi's over here. This stays lower to the ground, and these get larger in the middle here. And then here's some, oh, some other ground cover favorites. Um, the Kalanchoe Pamela, or flower dust plant. I like this a lot in combination with the Echeverias, the pink Echeverias, it looks really good together, in my opinion. So I use that combination quite a bit. The pastel colors blend well. This is that Sedum Confusum I showed you earlier. That one holds up really well. It has a pretty yellow flower. And then this is that pink ice plant or Oscularia deltoides again. It gets very large. Allow at least three feet of space in your garden for this plant. It will spread. And then this uh, Crassula campfire, uh, excuse me, Crassula campfire here in the middle. And the Crassula red pagoda on the left. And then the sedum repressed trade lemon ball is another one. So for those of you who want to encourage the bees and butterflies and hummingbirds, here are some of those that, that do well at this. Um, Aeoniums, when they bloom, boy, the bees are all over them. So 
Um, I have I don't see that many butterflies um, around the aeoniums around here, but uh, the cabbage moth I used to see a lot of it this year, not so much. Maybe the wind is keeping it away. Uh, then agaves, um, hummingbirds, moths, and bats. And then aloes, the hummingbirds, as I said before, here's an aloe bloom. And they typically, the hummingbirds are very attracted to the orange color and to the tubular shape of those flowers. Uh, and the see them autumn joy attracts a lot of bees. It's not the easiest thing to grow, but it, it does attract a lot of bees. And um, here's some others that are listed here. You can go back and review as well. So any questions at this point in time? Yes, let's see. Um, is there an app we can use to identify a, a succulent? Maybe one we can take a picture of what we see and identify what it is. Um, I have purchased multiple apps, plant apps. And to tell you the truth, they're terrible at identifying succulents. They, they're okay with, with non-succulents, and there might be one that's better than another, but I, I think I purchased three of them and I end up using Google Lens the majority of the time. So if you go to Google, the search little bar in Google, uh, you'll notice a little camera on the right corner of the Google search bar. And that camera will allow you to take a picture of the, of the plant and then it will search all of Google's database and come up with some um, choices for you. And, I find that to be more accurate than the plant ID apps, in my opinion. Wow, I oh, learned something today. <laughs> there was a little camera there. Yeah. Um, are there any full shade succulents? Full shade. Well, um, I have a variety of ones that are low light tolerant, and those would you those are not ones I would lose use in the landscape. Uh, they're they're Haworthias, Gasterias, um, and the like, and um, they're they're small. They're very small, so they don't show up well in the landscape. But they're fine for pots. But I'm not really going to discuss too much on pots today. In terms, uh, in terms of not very shade tolerant, the ones I mentioned are the most shade tolerant, which which would get by with less than four hours of sun. But as I said, if you put something in the closet door and shut the door, your, your plant's gonna die. So you gotta make sure there's some indirect light there somewhere. And so my aeoniums and my formiums grow fine on the north side of my building, um, especially you know in the summer months when the sun is high in the sky, they, they tend to get some sun when the sun comes up in the morning, when the sun sets at night. So they do tend to get some sun during their growing period. Well, excuse me, yeah. If, if you live on the coast, because we have cool temperatures in our summer here. If you live on the other side of the hill, it's going to be hotter and aeoniums do not grow well in heat. So that may be different for you on the other side of the hill, but I find that aeoniums tend to do fairly well in, in, uh, on the north side of my building. Okay. Have you ever mixed native California plants with succulents? Any suggestions? Native California succulent, by the way, I didn't mention this before, is a Dudleya bretonii. That's the only native succulent that I think I have. And in terms of other native California plants, I have tried growing a wide variety of them. They do not do well in pots because they're drought tolerant and in terms of um, deep root systems. So they, they have to have deep roots to survive going through a summer of drought in, in California. And they, they t those deep roots tap into the deeper water sources underground. And that's why they're considered drought tolerant, whereas succulents are considered drought tolerant because they hold water in their leaves and stems and roots, right? And they're, they're, their um, roots are only six inches, maybe 12 inches deep, whereas California natives have very deep root systems and so I can't, I don't have success growing them in pots here very much um, for a very length of time. And I've tried them in the landscape and they tend to get kind of unruly and, and large. Although I know there are master gardeners listening right now that can correct me. And I'm sure that they have found some that don't get unruly and are 
can maintain themselves pretty easily. And we will, we want to encourage California natives as much as possible because they attract a, the native pollinators and we want to do that as, as much as we can. Not all drought tolerant plants are California natives. That's a misconception. People come to me and they say, oh, I think I want to plant California natives. And they're, they're really meaning drought tolerant plants, meaning that they have deep root systems and they can, they can live they can survive with once or month, once or twice a month watering. That's the definition of drought tolerant here in the Bay Area, that they can survive with once or twice a month watering, uh, as succulents do. So hope that answers your question. Okay. Can you please explain dead heading of succulents? Yeah, I'm going to be talking about that. Okay. And then the last question, my each of very a dusty rose is now smaller and on a long stalk. It started out beautiful. What happened? Uh, well, they they tend to they it could be the flowering and that when they flower they tend to reduce their size. The plant tends to reduce its size and they start pupping. Echeverias will produce offsets or pups, so they might start pupping from the stem area. So she could be looking for that. But it could be a, a sun lack of sun and it elongating, reaching for the sun. That could be it too. It's hard to say, but <laughs> okay. there you have it. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that it for now? That's it. Someone's okay. still waiting for the pests, but you're getting to that. <laughs> yeah, and we won't have time for the propagation one, but I think we'll have time because I think that's, uh, yeah, we have about 15 minutes left. So let me keep going. Okay. Uh, Care and maintenance, I think I can zip through this pretty pretty quickly. Oh yeah, pest is part of care and maintenance. So I think I can get through this in 15 minutes, okay. Um, we're gonna talk about watering, soil amendments, and plant care maintenance-wise and pests next. So um, I used to tell everybody, let your succulents dry out completely between waterings, but I'm correcting myself now and I'm telling people, let them approach dryness at six inches in depth between waterings or dry to your finger depth, which is three, about three inches. So if you stick your finger in there and it's really dry, it's time to water it well until it's very moist. And you, don't be afraid to water them until they're wet. Um, a lot of people just sprinkle them and then all the roots stay on the surface and they never go deeper because roots tend to follow water. So you wanna water these things to six inches in depth when you water them. And then when the moisture meter you stick in is the six inch depth moisture meter and it says it's almost dry, it's right between dry and moist, then you wanna water well again until it's wet. Um, don't be afraid to give them water. And then you, you know when you water, the first time you go over it, it's gonna shed. The water's gonna shed off. So you can only water in one spot for maybe 30 times You know, with your watering wand going around about 30 times and then water starts to shed, you move on to the next area and the next area, and then you come back and you do it again. And you may have to do that three or four times to get that water down to a six inch depth. It may take a half an hour, like it takes me a half an hour to water my bed in the backyard, and it's about six by 20. So, um, you know, I, I, and I hand water because I have the patience to do that. It's meditative and I enjoy it, but you can also do drip watering. Uh, I, rec I don't recommend those little drip irrigation um, lines that, that are quarter inch little spaghetti tubes, I call them. Those only like usually water half a plant. And you really want to water the, the microbes in the soil and not just part of the root system. You want to wa you want to water everything. So usually I recommend something like this Netafim or any, any type, type of irrigation system that has the emitters built into the lines. And these are half inch lines. So this covers the entire area and they're usually spaced about 12 to 14 inches apart. Uh, when, you, when you lay these down, you can actually plant your garden and then lay them down around your plants. Um, that's what we, we tend to do a lot. Um, but just be sure you water in the entire zone and you water deeply to six inches at least. And then um, hand watering is, has an advantage of watering, you know, getting rid of maybe aphids. You can wash away your aphids at the same time. Um, and then, so just keep in mind also less water can improve color. So if you're overwatering your garden, you may have a greener garden than a redder garden. Just keep that in mind. Um, 
I installed rain barrels this past year and I'm glad I did because of our intermittent rains. I only did it because we get so much fog here. I thought, oh boy, I'm gonna be collecting a lot of water on our foggy days. Much to my surprise, we haven't had fog this year. We've had nothing but cold wind. And then our rains are like very scattered and intermittent. So we had, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we had a half inch of rain, it filled up both of my rain barrels and 10 buckets to boot. So I, I tend to use that when I'm, when I'm uh, repotting things, I tend to use all that water up. So there are rebates available. You can go to Bosca um, at this link and see if there's a rebate available in your area and, um, and give it a try. Uh, it, the rainwater is the best water in the world for plants. It's slightly acidic, they love it. It also contains nitrates and oxygen, oxygen that it gets from the air and it's 100% soft, plus, plus, plus. Okay, signs of underwatering. Uh, when you see shriveling, that's a sign of underwatering. Or in this case, you can see dead desiccated leaves and shriveling of the leaves. And here's an obvious shriveling of the leaves and air roots. These roots are just trying to get to the soil as des desperately as they can. And um, that's what they're called aerial roots. And then this uh, aeonium at one point in time has a little narrow little stem up here. And then you can tell, well, that was a period of time when that plant was a little bit deprived of water. So usually the stems are a little thicker when they get enough water and then they start to, to thin out when the water is in short supply. Overwatering, how can you tell if something is overwatered? Well, it will droop and just bend over like this aeonium. I tend, I was watering this in the heat of our, our, our heat is September, October, and, and I was watering this during that period of time and thinking, oh, that's what it needs more water. Well, in fact, it's not growing then because it was so warm and it just sat in water and this is what happened. Um, over here, the agave leaf rot it tends to look black in color. They don't get so mushy because they have a fibrous leaf, but when you see black coloration, that could very well be rot. This kiwi aeonium is just kind of falling apart here and the leaves are just falling off and that is an indication of rot. And this, uh, this echeveria, the elegans, as I said before, this one has a tendency to get rot more than others. Then I would just lift it out of the soil, give it some air. And then when the rain passes and the soil dries out a little bit, you can just stick it back in the soil. They're easily moved around. They don't, it doesn't bother them at all. Here's agave root rot where the uh, roots rotted first and then the leaves started just shriveling up on this uh, agave um, Queen Victoria, I think that's what this is. And then a kalanchoe stem rot, when the stem gets rotten, the leaves just fall off. So fertilizing and amending. So, so we master gardeners try to think sustainably in, for the betterment of the earth. And we don't recommend synthetic fertilizer very often. Uh, you know, you may have to use it with pots in, in some situations with pots, although there are, there are solutions, there are other alternatives to, to fertilizing pots that I'll mention a little bit later. Um, so organic is sustainable and synthetic is not. And so try to build a compost pile if you can. Use your compost. That's a great source of um, fertil fertilization. And that's what, that's what uh, those microbes just thrive on eating. And it also add nut adds nutrients when you use compost. Um, so as I mentioned, the organic feeds the soil life and in turn, the soil life feeds your plants. The synthetic, like some, something like a 522 synthetic fertilizer will feed your plants directly right into the plant and and it usually only contains nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, whereas whole organic fertilizers also contain trace minerals and micronutrients. Compost would have that, for instance. So when you see growth from a plant, when you pour that miracle Grow fertilizer on your plant and you see stupendous growth and you say, oh, great, my plant is so, so healthy, don't be deceived by that because growth does not necessarily equal health. It's like Growing your plants on steroids is, is what happens sometimes when you over fertilize with synthetic fertilizers. It's not necessarily a healthy growth and one that's going to help them survive. So feed your soil, not your plants over and over again. That's our mantra. Um, apply 
This is what I do to my bed uh, twice a year. I apply a half inch to one inch of quality compost or soil amendment or aged horse manure with shavings. That's what I have access to over here in Half Moon Bay, but it has to be well aged. And I apply that twice a year, early fall and spring to the top of the soil and the microbes come up and feed off of that and they're very happy campers. Um, note that horse manure can contain pathogenic bacteria and weed seeds if it's not properly composted. So you have to make sure your source is a good source of aged horse manure. And mine comes with the shavings in it, the wood shavings from horse stalls. So it serves as a compost and a mulch. Or you can alternatively apply fish emulsion, which is 511 usually, or compost tea, which you can brew yourself, but takes a little, little knowledge base to do that. And there's also something called Mupu tea. It's Mupu tea bags. And you can actually, yeah, I, I think you know what it means. Um, <laughs> so you can take these tea bags made from Mupu and um, you can make your own tea and apply that. And it, those also work really well for pots. I would say that's better than compost for pots because you don't have a whole lot of room to add compost on your, on your pots. Um, rocks as mulch. Let's see what, how the time is coming. We're gonna, uh, hopefully I can get through this. Um, rocks as mulch. A lot of people want to use rocks as mulch and they see these YouTube videos of this designer down in Southern California who loses them routinely. I don't recommend them uh, very often. There are some exceptions and um, I will show you the pros and the cons of using rocks as mulch. The pros is that they're, um, it gives better weed suppression than wood mulches, but you have to use weed cloth underneath and that can be a disadvantage. Um, they're best for desert specimen plants that don't require many nutrients because those rocks uh, do not provide, do not feed the soil life. So um, it's better to choose plants like jade or um, agaves, for instance, that don't need a lot of nutrients if you wanna use rocks around specimen plants. Um, they can add design elements, as you saw in that last slide. They're fireproof. Um, they can provide a buffer zone from dogs. So a lot of times I'll put them along the edge of a sidewalk so the dogs that are walking in the neighborhood don't disturb your succulents. Um, they can, the cons include they can possibly overheat your roots in hot climates. Um, rocks do not feed the soil life, as I said before. <clears throat> they may limit the spreading of tapestry designs that you want to spread because um, you have to move the rocks to allow the, them to spread. And they can churn into the soil when weeding or transplanting. So you'd have to take the rocks out, wash them, put the rocks back. It's a lot of, it's a pain in the neck in my opinion. And it can also increase soil compaction. So I'm not a big fan of rocks, if you can tell. Plant maintenance, we'll run through this real quickly. Um, removal of lower lid leaves and transplanting and deadheading. Let me try to zip through this in just a couple of minutes. So it's a natural process for these <clears throat> aeoniums to have dead leaves along the base of the plant, especially in, their, in the summer months when they're not growing, they're gonna you're gonna have more of this, these desiccated leaves. So just pull them off, no big deal. You can throw them underneath the plant if you want and help feed the soil life. Um, transplanting, as I said, is very easy because they're very shallow rooted. You can easily move them around as I do quite often. Um, <clears throat> you can divide them. Agaves will, pup, will, will grow pups along their base like this agave americana in my backyard. This is long, very, on a very long stolen here or right next to the base of the agave. The pups are always coming up. So you can always share them with your friends and then everyone can have a, an agave americana in their backyard if you have room for it. But they're very easy to divide and deep up. Deadheading, um, take your loppers to the aeoniums once these aeoniums bloom and that they're, they're monocarpic, meaning they die after they bloom, but no problem. You just, you just cut it back to a natural point or a branch in the, in the, to another <coughs> branch. And then there's plenty more of growth below it to keep growing, to keep growing on. Um, you can prune these calendrinia by just yanking out the, bit, the, the stems from the bottom. That's one way to do that easily without using any pruners. You can cut off the, just the flowers once they have died. You can just easily prune those off uh, once the hummingbirds are no longer interested in them. 
and um, you can constantly, yeah, and, and you can just prune back anything, basically, and they, they do well, they rebound. Snails and slugs, that's my arch nemesis. Um, I'm, I probably won't talk about it. I'm gonna refer you to the pest notes. Uh, I do go out and hunt them with my little headlamp on at night. And this is what I found one night on, on my uh, Senecio. So if you see little, little indentations in your leaves, you probably have a snail hiding somewhere. So look under a pot, look under a rock, look under a leaf and try to find them during the day or go out at night. And then you can always go to our pest notes uh, just Google UCANR pest notes and you can find all the solutions to your pest problems by going to our site, our website, Master Gardener UCANR website. Um, aphids are not a big problem in the landscape because I have healthy plants and they repel aphids and other pests. Um, but if you do have a problem, I usually take them from a pot, put them in the ground and and nature takes its course and I usually don't have very many aphids after I do that, put them back in healthy soil. And there's a pest note on that one as well. And you can read up on that. Um, other people talked about spider webs and things like that and in agaves, you can take a whisk broom and just sweep away the spider webs. Um, spider mites and mealybugs are usually a greenhouse or house plant problem. So you can put them outside. Usually nature takes care of you know, the natural predators may take care of it. Air circulation may take care of it. Um, yeah, that's usually a, a problem, solves that problem. Uh, leaf rolling, this is a cabbage moth that has this little green larva and it, past few years, it's been a real problem for me. And they eat the apical tip of the plant and kill the plant almost. This year is not as much of a problem because we have horrendous winds now. But in years past, it's been an issue. So keep an eye out for a little webbiness and that a little webbiness around the apical tip of a plant. And that could be that little green larva from the cabbage moth. And there's a pest note on that and how to deal with it. And here's another, there's some webbiness from that little larva. So you may have that little creature eating the tip, eating the tip of your plant right here. So keep an eye out for that little green larva. And then you can deal with it by researching that pest note. Okay, that's my propagation video, which we don't have time for. I'm sorry we're out of time. I'm sorry I went over a little bit, but any other questions? Uh, yes, let's see. Well, what does one do when they thin out and grow tall? Well, you can always lop off the top if it's an area, lop it off, callus at the end over, and replant it someplace else. But if it's, if it's really getting tall and it could be a lack of sunlight. You know, you don't, I don't really know without seeing the situation, but when things get really tall, that's usually an indication to me that it's seeking out the sun. Hard to say. Um, should you put weeds in compost? There are no seeds, viable seeds. Or if, you, if it has a flower, then it's probably not a good idea because there might be some viable seed in there. Um, but yes, you can put, you can put weeds in your compost pile usually most of the time unless there's you know flowers or seeds. And our last question is is worm tea good to use? Um, yeah, yeah, you can use that. Um, I have had a few problems with it. I can't remember what what the issue was. It's really high in nitrogen. I think it was, yeah. Uh, I think compost tea might be a better alternative than, than, worm, than worm casting tea, but you could give it a try as long as there's enough air circulation. I think it was a problem with attracting flies, uh, the, little, uh, the little fungus flies or something. Is, that might have been the issue I had with it. But um, just make sure the air circulation is good. It's not an enclosed area. All right. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Janice. That was a lot of information packed into our hour and a half. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, and and uh, there's my references that you'll be getting with the uh, P PDF slide presentation, right. so you can review all of that. Okay. So I'll be sending all of that out either tomorrow or the beginning of next week. So thank you, everyone, for attending, and uh, hopefully I'll see you all in August. All right. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.